is there a relationship at all between kidney health and advanced glycation in products? And, and what are advanced glycation in products? Just so people have a solid understanding. Because I think people think that if they, I know people think, because I see it on Instagram all the time, that if they eat, <laughs> a, sweet, if they eat a sweet potato, where, <laughs> eat a sweet potato <laughs> with some ground beef, that it's automatically glycated and it's going to mm. be a problem. And I know that's not necessarily the case. Like, how does it all work? Yeah, so there's, there's a few things. So advanced glycation end products are the addition of carbohydrate onto proteins. And there's a, there's a few different ways that this can happen. So you have like an, an in, non-enzymatic version of that. So that's the one that I think is the primary concern where you actually have just abundant glucose and and this is i'm talking about in the blood in particular so if you have very high glucose over long periods of time that will just uh, ran you know by virtue of the abundance of glucose will cause its addition to proteins and then that changes the the protein structure because proteins are designed to have many different um, sugar molecules on them so in you know i think it's hard to conceptualize if you don't know about this but every cell has this thing called the glycocalyx and the cell is just this, it has all these proteins protruding out of it. And then you have on each one of those proteins, you have all these branched sugar molecules all over it. And those are very important, the the, the orientation of them, like how they are, um, like how they're linked, which sugars are on there. They tell a message to cells in the body about like, this is a, this is me, do not kill this cell, this is me, or this is a docking site for a particular protein to bind to. So that orientation of those is very important in the glycocalyx. When blood glucose levels go very high, you can start to add glucose molecules onto those those branching chains and or onto the proteins themselves. And so now the code has been disrupted. So now a cell might see that and say, hey, this is no longer self, and then it causes an autoimmune disease. Or a, another protein can no longer identify its docking location, and so it can't bind to the cell appropriately. Or it might cause other things to bind to it inappropriately. So it changes the signaling just on itself. So that's a that's a big part of it. And then you have the glycation of proteins themselves within the body, and that can then cause an activation of a of a, a receptor that identifies these um, these proteins that it triggers inflammation on itself. And that's the the rage receptor, the receptor for AGE. Today's sponsor is 25% off of seed symbiotic. That is a prebiotic and a probiotic. Now, the cool thing about Seed is that they have a unique technology that puts a capsule inside of a capsule. Now, what that means is you're getting potentially the appropriate delivery of the prebiotics and the probiotics to where it needs to go. And that's a big claim to fame for them. But what's more important to me with Seed is that they actually put their money where their mouth is with research. They actually fund a lot of interesting studies that are related to the gut and not just the gut microbiome, but just the gut in general whether or not it aligns with what they're after as a company or as a brand. They just want to do the research and understand more. And they continually evolve. And that's exactly what I look for in a company. And it's pretty darn cool. That's why they've been a sponsor on this channel for years, because we align and I wholeheartedly support that. They're also a tremendous supporter of the content that we create. And the best way that you can support this channel is doing something good for you by supporting our sponsors as well. So that link down below saves you 25% off your daily symbiotic is in the top line of the description underneath this video. Does that ever happen uh, like acutely? Like, is there a situation where you consume, let's just go extreme scales, you know, a pixie stick and whey protein powder or something <laughs> like two very fast absorbing, like you uh -huh. get these, does it ever happen that fast or is this much more like a-, a That's a good question. I would imagine that, you know, the, the rate is probably much slower because there's no, since it's non-enzymatic, it requires um, the functionalization of a of a glucose or its target. Mm -hmm. It's like organic chemistry question. Like you know, like it's just the amounts that are there is just it's ran. There's like a random amount that will go through that process. So if it's the time interaction is a big part of it. So how long they interact is it is will determine also not just the concentration. Concentration does a lot. So if you had them like sitting in a glass and they were there for a long time together, you might be able to cause a non-enzymatic uh, reaction to occur. But during like, you know, your your blood glucose spikes up and then it goes back down. Like, is that long enough to cause that effect? Unlikely, yeah. I would think. Yeah. I also wonder about someone that's like, you know, Tour de France athlete that's like 
keeping their glucose high while they're riding for mm -hmm. you know, hours and hours and hours, it's like, hmm, okay, maybe that that might be good for performance, but possibly Could still be deleterious. Yeah, yeah, like or at least I mean, it's kind of funny because when you look at a lot of and this is purely hypothetical, but I mean, you look at a lot of endurance athletes and a lot of them, you know, that are fueling like I mean, they they age very fast, right? Like you see, you see, you know, we've talked about this in videos. Like you see that guy that's. I've been running my whole life. He's 60 years old. He looks like he's 80. You mm -hmm. know, it's like there's obviously this effect of like oxidative damage. But mm -hmm. then I think about that too. Like with athletes, it's like, okay, if you're even if you are independent of AMPK phosphorylation, it seems like there is probably not a good, it's not a good position to be in where you're keeping your glucose levels high all the time, even if it's for performance. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that I think there's probably some arterial stiffening that occurs from that as well. So that's probably some of the stuff you're talking, you're talking about, like the you seem like they're aging or they sometimes have heart attacks and whatnot. It's not just the stress. It's probably yeah some other metabolic stuff that's going on from having high glucose all the time. Do uh, AGEs or are there rage receptors sort of in our vasculature as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah. So yeah. this can something that impacts, I mean, literally everything. Yeah. What about crossing the blood brain barrier? Any, any evidence uh, there? I guess it would depend on the size of the protein, right? That yeah. just depends on which one it is it's there. I imagine that because there's a cutoff limit to like what can get across. Yeah. So I'd, I don't know. That's a good question. So this kind of comes a full circle moment back to the chicken nuggets, right? So it's like you think based on that study, with kidney function, do you think it had more to do with the pure oxidation of the oils, or do you think there was this AGE effect, or was it both? It's both. Yeah, yeah. the oxidized oxidized lipids and um, the advanced glycation end products both have effects on kidney function. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of, and they're both kind of working in that same same avenue. I mean, is it, so we talked a little bit about how like the oxidation could impact that, and then the, and I knew you touched on it briefly. Mm -hmm. But in the same way that sort of we've heard advanced glycation end products can affect liver metabolism and potentially mm -hmm. fatty liver, same kind of same kind of concept there with the kidneys. Yeah, I think that's the same concept. Anytime you have these these inflammatory compounds, they just trigger the same cascades. It's always like the same same players, like the you know free radicals, NLRP three, all that stuff gets turned on in response to these these pathways. So it's just like. You kind of just pick your poison, and it kind of usually does the same thing. And that's so, so the AGEs and and uh, these um, oxidized lipids are are both going to trigger the similar events. Do you think that more of the problem when we look at seed oils and people kind of having a heyday on that? Do you think it comes down much more to the the oxidation, or, or I mean, what, what's kind of your take there? Again, I, not your realm of expertise per se. But well, I have an opinion. Yeah, <laughs> I have an opinion on a lot of things. Maybe I shouldn't have. <laughs> but uh, I think that oxidation is probably the bigger, bigger effect there. So if you're the reasons you avoid the reason avoiding seed oils is, is you know, people talk, can mention all sorts of different reasons. I would just say, like, probably the oxidation is the biggest player because any oxidized lipids is bad. Like if you have olive oil just sitting out for too long and it goes rancid or butter, like all these things, doesn't matter what it is. It's just going to, it's going to, it's not good. Like it's, it's bad for your cells. Um, cause these can, these, these can get incorporated into membranes and once they're in the membranes, they cause damage to the membranes and, and then that injures the cell. And then you have to, you know, you have to kill that cell. So it's just, the oxidation is likely the most damaging culprit. And then, then you can go into like the ratios, like, you know, you're getting too much omega six, you're going down this pro inflammatory pathway preferentially or whatnot. And I think that's probably secondary to the, the oxidized story. Yeah. Like a lot of the literature is suggesting that as far as the, you know, prostaglandins and the omega six, omega three, that's much less of an important point. You know, I think we're finding that yeah. like, as far as you're all ending up down the arachidonic acid kind of pathway anyway, mm -hmm. and ultimately ending up at a lot of the same place in a lot of cases. Exactly. It's like you take someone that's eating a bunch of omega-6s, but if it's good, legitimate, fresh omega-6, which I don't know if anyone even gets that, yeah. right? Like, but if someone right. was like picking picking nuts off of a tree and, most, you know, <laughs> again, kind of begs the question of who is actually getting that. So then it kind of comes full circle. It's like, well, I mean, are you getting any seed oils that are actually mm -hmm. fresh? And it's like, we can demonize seed oils till we're blue in the face, but the reality is it's like, no one is like squeezing sunflower seeds in their garage and consuming them immediately, right? <laughs> but it's the, the question of the, inflammation piece of omega threes versus omega six is much less of the situation these days. Yeah. It's the oxidation. Yeah. And this, I mean, people, the main sources of omega sixes are going to be from deep fryers. 
Yeah. I mean, that's like the main place everybody's getting their exposure. And, you know, then if you're getting it from a, I don't know, they, you, they usually say like, um, like you buy foods in the grocery store. I don't know how much of those are actually the industrial versions of things either. They're probably nowadays, I think they're, a lot of products are, they say like expeller pressed mm-hmm. and whatnot. So those are probably don't have the same oxidation level as it, if you're eating it from a deep fryer. So it's hard to like talk about like what the effects are because you got to know like the sources, like how did they actually, you know, test these things. And yeah. so it's, I think there's a lot of stuff that needs to be figured out. In terms of tips for avoiding sort of advanced glycation in products, that sort of world, do you have any tips for people or is it really so a, man- a matter of just bringing <laughs> your glucose down? Uh, yeah, if you're, I mean, avoiding them is the least fun part because that's like barbecues and, and frying food and whatnot. Um, it does seem like if you add vinegar to things, it does prevent a lot of the, the glyc- glycation from occurring. So like it also cooking things like slow fryers and stuff increases, you know, if it's l- low and slow is the good one. It's the high and dry is the, that's always the way I remember it. Like high and dry is going to cause more of these things to occur. And the low and slow is the, oh, so air fryers might be out. I know they're fry so yummy. I think if you put some vinegar on there, maybe you can try to mitigate some balsam- balsamic, balsamic, yeah. yeah, like balsamic chicken in the air fryer. Yeah. So you got some balsamic vinegar with it or something. And try not to put it the heat so high as to cause it. But yeah, the air fryer would be a, a source of these things. <laughs> it's just everything, as I'm saying, like everything is like, it's ruined. But again, if you think about these things in more of like a holistic or, you know, a bigger picture thing. It's all about like punctuated equilibrium or punctuated stress, right? So if you're eating these things day after day after day, that's going to be probably a bigger problem than if it's like, this is like once a week or, you know, so often I'm eating this food that I cook in a less ideal way. But then as long as you've got all your other things on point, you're probably going to not be a big deal. It's probably more like a hermetic stress. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. And it's saying if high and dry is a problem, so is high, from what you've seen, is high and dry worse than high and oily? So that's, yeah, that's the question, right? <laughs> I mean, like, if you're going to deep fry something, even in like avocado oil, is that you're like, okay, I'm using a healthy fat. We can still oxidize, even in a, you know. Yeah, it's still uh, oxidize. Yeah, still, and, you know, is that, I guess you have a different element than you're like stacking problems, right? It's like if you were to air fry, Let's say, let's even say a healthy chicken nugget. Say a chicken nugget that you breaded with something like <laughs> some almond flour or something like that, and you uh-huh. air fried it, which is something that I've done. Okay, then you've got maybe a little bit of fat, but mainly pretty lean, and you're you're eating it at a high temperature compared to like frying that same healthy chicken nugget in a bunch of avocado oil. It's like on one hand, high and dry, you're getting more potential AGE, but mm-hmm. in the oil, you're getting some AGE plus some, oxidized oil. Right, exactly. So it's pick your poison, really. Exactly. <laughs> I know. Like food preparation is just a, I mean, it's all can of worms, right? What do you boil everything? I mean, yeah. that's like the, that's what it comes down to. It's like a boil and steam all your food. Yeah. So it's like, you know, how much life are you willing to, to trade for a living? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good point, man. I think that, you know, the dose makes the poison at the exactly. end of the day. And then uh, just bringing it back to kidneys for just a second. If this has an effect on the kidneys, how long do you typically see improvement afterwards? And at what point does it become uh, like irreversible where it's actually causing real problems to the kidney? Are you saying improvement from the... Just the consumption, like back to the chicken nugget kind uh, of okay. thing. So I think you said it was a couple of weeks yeah, or something, Yeah, I think right? that was a couple of weeks of decreased function that they observed, yeah. And then eventually any literature within that same study, like with chronic consumption, does it just become like a a spiral downwards or? I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think that once you, the inflammation is meant to be acute. Once it becomes chronic, that just those, there's just like that, that pathway, the pathway for inflammation is meant to be like on resolve the issue and then go back to the normal state. When it's on, you just kind of end up with a lot of weird stuff that happens because cells are, they're kind of like in this preparatory state, like they're, they're like wanting to do something and they kind of like, what's going to happen. And so at that preparatory state, all these other maintenance things turn off. So like the normal state of, of like clearing out damaged organelles and mitochondria, like that gets turned off while you're in this preparatory state, because that's all like repair rest function. And in the inflammatory state, you have to be ready to like divide or to make, you know, you don't want to be like doing something when there's an injury around because, you know, you're going to mess something up. That's like these very delicate processes like cell division. And so when things do go 
awry in that state it's because they've like accumulated damage yeah. and that's where you get like cancer cells that's like that's kind of like the pathology of cancer so i mean people very much so can feel an acute impact of food then i mean it's just because sometimes people look at me like i'm crazy when i say hey, well if i eat that i sometimes i'll say i feel inflamed i don't know if that's the right word but like something is off mm -hmm. clearly you know like my i feel stiff i feel achy my workout performance is in the toilet it's like okay clearly like that dietary choice mm -hmm. made an impact over here um you know so it's almost though you can feel the effects of chronic inflammation in a short term phase. Mm -hmm. And then there's people that have that turned on all this, all the time. And then people that are like a little healthier and they, they feel those changes, right? It's, it's, I've always kind of likened it to that. I'm a pretty healthy person. Mm -hmm. So the Delta between like when I have something that actually makes me feel inflamed, I feel it versus maybe someone that's just, they're on all the time. Exactly. Maybe they don't feel it. Exactly. Yeah. You, you described a, a very good phenomenon. So I, I had mentioned before that, you know, we're in this, it's, cells are homeostatic regulators so they you know whatever that mean mean is is your state and when you go up or down below that you feel it if you're in a good sense sensitization state if you're in a highly inflamed state that regulator has moved up so now that's your baseline so you might not going to feel additional inflammation you might feel when it goes down because that's you know that's a big difference in the delta but if you just keep going up above that it's not a big change so there's no sensation so I think that's what you're describing yeah. is that 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 homeostatic regulation has changed. So when you're healthy, it's like you can sense when something's wrong because this is not normal. Like there's some acute change that's happened. So to get off the roller coaster, just feel like it all the time. Yeah. Just chicken nuggets all day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>